with you. I will be going through this rather quickly um, as there was a lot of great information to cover. And again, this was my best attempt at summarizing all the fantastic content we had in our session. We started off with fundamental concepts and assessment with Meg Malone. And Meg invited us at the beginning to recall our best assessment experiences as students and teachers. And also think about if we were ever surprised by the results of an assessment. And when I thought back, it was always scenarios where I was very well prepared for my assessments. And as a teacher, I really like seeing consistent results and great results from my students. And that's what great assessment does. It effectively measures student learning and it yields expected results um, every time. We talked about the six fundamental concepts in assessment. Um, among those are ethics. These are the beliefs that guide how we behave and how we treat each other. And when we create assessments, we need to keep a lot of ethical codes in mind to make sure that we're doing a good job and assessing our students um, and using ethical assessments. We need to think about impact. How do the results of our assessments impact students? teachers, policy, and community. So when we think about high stakes testing, we have to think about how that could potentially impact things like policy, community, even government. We should consider practicality, considering factors like money, space, equipment, time, and staff when creating our assessments. Meg told us a great story about how when she was in a situation where she was taking a listening comprehension test at a university, that she took the test in a large gymnasium and a lot of the students and test takers had a lot of trouble. So we have to consider practicality. Do we have the resources to um, provide a good assessment? Also considering constraints on time, um, grading that assessment as well as holding it and staff. Is the staff willing, able, and competent enough to provide um, great feedback and great assessment on our assessments? We should also consider authenticity. So it's important to create assessments that use authentic materials and mimic real world situations. So in a perfect world, I would be able to take my students over to Japan and cut them loose for a few days, follow them around everywhere and see how they do. But that wouldn't be very practical. But what I can do is I can use things like authentic text and try to potentially work some real world situations into my assessments. Um, I think Meg talked about how when she was in high school, she did an assessment where she had to order an ice cream cone in the target language. So that's a great tool that we have to use authentic materials and assessments. Meg also talked about the concept of validity versus reliability. And she gave us this great scale analogy. So the scale in my bathroom right now is probably not quite calibrated correctly. So if I stand on it, it's going to give me my weight. And if I go and weigh myself in six months from now and see that I lost five pounds, then I can see, okay, this was reliable. It was reliable that my scale showed me that I lost five pounds. However, the weight that the scale might be giving me maybe not be a valid weight. So if I were to go to the doctor's office and get onto a calibrated scale, it might give me a different weight, but it still would reflect that I've lost those five pounds. So that's the difference between reliability, where the results are consistent, versus validity, showing the strength of the argument that, that really proves that the assessment is valid and it's appropriate for the audience and the use. Meg also talked about how validity is sort of on a spectrum. So, you know, maybe a test isn't completely invalid. However, we want to make sure that we really have strong arguments that prove that our assessments are valid and they're appropriate for the audience and the use. In our session with Fernando Rubio, we talked about the overview of similarities and differences between assessment and online courses and face-to-face -face courses. So we talked about the face-to-face -face environment characteristics versus the online environment characteristics. In a face-to-face -face environment, generally speaking, the environment's engaging. We can provide immediate feedback to our students. It's very easy for them to request and provide support for us. And there's better opportunities to network. In the online environment, we have some advantages in that we're flexible and we provide 24-7 access for our students. And in some cases, they can learn at their own pace. Our format in the online world does encourage learner responsibility and in some cases requires better discipline. There's also the potential for students to feel isolated in the online world as we're not typically meeting face-to-face -face unless we're in a hybrid type of a course. We talked about second language acquisition and how it works. So input truly is the key ingredient to language acquisition. If we look over at the chart here, we have input right on top. 
So students also need to interact with others um, in the language and create their own output in order to acquire language skills. So these are all interrelated. And then I love how he put feedback at the middle of the triangle. Feedback is what allows the students to understand that they're doing well in some areas and maybe see where they need to improve in other areas in order to move up that proficiency ladder. We also talked about assessing the three modes of communication in face-to-face -face and in online classrooms. Starting off with the interpretive mode. So again, this is taking the information in and put it together. So for example, reading an authentic text, watching a YouTube video, or reading a book in the target language. In the face-to-face -face classroom, we have the ability to give instant feedback. It's easy for teachers to intervene. However, sometimes giving individual feedback, especially in the classroom environment that's face-to-face, -face, is very time-consuming and pretty difficult to personalize. In the online classroom, there is less teacher intervention. Students are the ones that are controlling the time of exposure. There's some automated instant feedback. But we do have the advantage that we can provide that very deep, intricate, personalized feedback. The disadvantage, though, is that it takes time. In the interpersonal mode, so this is synchronous exchange of communication. So think about meeting a friend at a coffee shop, um, having a phone conversation, or doing a session over Google Hangouts. In the face-to-face -face classroom, it's very easy to communicate synchronously. Students can receive the immediate feedback again. They can modify their output. Um, it's, however, on the negative sides, it's always impossible to get all of the students to attend in one place all the time. And feedback is also somewhat unsystematic. In the online classroom, we have the delayed and specific feedback for each student. So sometimes if we're very quick to interrupt a student while they're speaking, they might be a little bit leery um, of continuing on. Um, in the, um, sorry, in the online classroom, however, there's that delayed feedback so they can continue on with their speech and they're getting the feedback after they're complete. It's nice that every student can attend in the online environment since we're flexible and students have time to plan their interactions um, to be synchronous. Technology also makes the interaction sometimes less natural though, so that can also be a setback. In the presentational mode, in the face-to-face -face classroom, now this is again the one-to-many communication. So for example, a student giving a speech. So in the face-to-face -face classroom, there is that authentic exposure to a larger audience that can make people nervous. So sometimes it's good to give students that exposure. It's easy to monitor for academic integrity. We, however, use a lot of class time whenever each individual student is doing a presentation. It might also be a little bit boring for the other students who make up the audience to listen to so many presentations on similar topics. In the online classroom, our presentations can be recorded and archived for later use. So we can provide that more specific feedback for students. I can certainly vouch that many times when I'm listening to a recording, I will stop and go back and re-listen to something. So I make sure that I heard it right the first time. Um, so when we are giving that self-guided, uh, sorry, when we are able to give self-guided and peer feedback review systems, that's another advantage to the online learning environment. It does set itself up nicely for peer review. Also, the online environment might reduce anxiety levels for some students, and there's lots of great online tools like Prezi, YouTube, Google Slides, Vimeo, VoiceThread, I could go on and on, but lots of different tools we can use for the presentational mode. We also talked about why do we assess? And we assess to gather evidence of student learning and to help students answer the three basic questions that will ultimately help them progress. And those questions are, where am I going? How am I doing? And where to next? So in a presentation, Fernando suggested that we assess more effectively by kind of breaking those questions down and thinking about how to provide the best feedback. So in terms of where am I going, we want to model the performance that we expect for the students. For how am I doing, we want to make sure we're using well-crafted rubrics to assess student work. And for the where to next, we want to make sure that we're providing detailed feedback on assessments. The next session we had was with Dr. Jennifer Eddy talking about student learning outcomes and backward design. So the two questions that we need to keep in mind when we are creating assessments are, how can we ensure that an assessment has a strong argument for validity 
and how can we help students effectively use what we teach in class in real world situations. So Dr. Eddy started us off with the iceberg concept of culture. She had this great graphic here that shows that most of the components that make up culture are hidden below the surface of an iceberg. And culture is truly at the basis of our learning objectives. This is where the content and ultimately our assessments are going to come from. And backward design is where this really truly starts. It starts with the culture and that helps us to identify what our learning results are ultimately going to be. Dr. Eddy talked about how transfer was one of the best gifts we can give to students. So as you all know, language use in the real world situations is often extremely unpredictable. And language learners need to be able to feel comfortable and adapt to any new and unpredictable situations and circumstances they might encounter out in the real world. So as educators, we should prepare students for those real world situations where they are going to face what Dr. Eddy called the inevitable unexpected. And a great way to do that is to involve students in tasks that are novel and new to them and force them to independently use their knowledge and skills in a context that's different from what was originally learned. We talked then about the three stages of backward design. In stage one, we want to identify our desired results. So this is where we decide what the student should understand and gather by the end of our lesson. We'll wanna use culture to provide reason and the purpose for the lesson. In stage two, we want to determine acceptable evidence. So in this stage, we determined what is it exactly that's going to show students, um, have students show us rather, what they've learned. How can they demonstrate their knowledge effectively in those tasks that leverage the three modes of communication? This is also the stage where you're going to plan that big summative assessment and write out those questions and really have a plan in place to say, okay, now that I have my actual assessment, I'm going to move on to stage three, and that is where we plan the learning experiences and instruction. So after the summative assessment's already created, we work backwards to design that lesson content and those other smaller formative tasks. So using this new backward design paradigm, we can factor these questions in. What do I want the students to revisit and remember about the culture? What do I want the learner to be able to do at the end? What do they need to do to move forward with novelty and transfer. And the end result is ultimately a more effective lesson and a more effective assessment for the learner. So the backward design plan paradigm is truly becoming the new normal um, versus the prior designs where we would plan out the vocabulary and the grammar points and then kind of put the assessment as an afterthought. I also really liked this little tree analogy here talking about artic uh, articulated curriculum design. So we're kind of imagining the curriculum as a tree. Um, and then the enduring understandings are really the trunk of the tree. So these are the recurring themes that are going to guide the different branches. Our branches are going to be our performative assessment tasks, or performance assessment tasks rather. And these are going to change a little bit, just like the branches of a tree will grow and change as our students progress, our activities for them will grow and change. Then finally, we factor in the leaves. Those come off of the branches. These are the learning experiences, the formative tasks, and the instructions. And really, um, a tree won't grow leaves until after it has roots and a trunk and branches. So these are kind of the last piece. We design those after the summative assessments are designed. So this creates a really rich and engaging learning experience for the students and really illustrates the importance of backward design in creating assessments. In our next session with JD Brown, we took a look at evaluation criteria and rubrics in online courses. So language assessment should not always consist of right and wrong answers. And that was one of the key takeaways I took with me from this sessions. Um, so it's different, whereas, you know, with a math class, you might have one right answer a student should come to at the end of um, doing the problem and they might be able to choose that on a test. But in language assessment is very open-ended. A lot of our assignments, because of the nature of what we do, they are open-ended. So we need effective ways to evaluate the student responses and progress. And I have this definition here from JD Brown on what is a rubric, which is a great tool to do that. So a rubric is typically a grid set up in one of two ways with the scores along one axis of the grid and language behavior descriptors inside the grid for what each score means in terms of language performance. Or, a rubric can be with language categories alone on one axis and scores along the other axis. 
and the language behavior descriptors inside the grid for what each score means in terms of the language performance. So let's talk a little bit about that. So this is the difference between the holistic rubrics and the analytic rubrics. Holistic rubrics, these use the single general scale that provide the single general rating for the student performance. And just to jump ahead here for a moment, this is an example of a holistic rubric. So this was taken from his presentation. So you can see that there are, um, your students are basically only going to see one score and the descriptors are here. I'm not sure how well you can read them, but they're pretty general. And as the evaluator goes through and evaluates the student's performance on the assessment, the student's going to be placed into one of these five categories based on the rubric. So this is what we mean by a holistic rubric. We're not breaking down into nitty gritty elements of the tasks. We're giving an overall snapshot of where the student is placing according to the rubric. And then for analytic rubrics, these provide separate ratings for the different categories where students will be evaluated on their performance. This is more time consuming, but this format also lends itself very nicely to specific feedback, which is really crucial in the online environment. Typically, these are used um, for the diagnostic assessments that measure student progress and achievement. So if we look at the holistic rubric, this is you know, maybe more general. Um, this calls, comes to mind the actual proficiency ratings and the actual proficiency tests is sort of what that makes me think of where you're going and doing your assessment and you are placed in a category. This is more of a holistic version. Now, whereas the analytic scale, we have each different category broken out and then the ratings, for example, excellent to good, good to adequate, and then adjusting forward. Um, so the really the the rater can really consider, okay, these are the different elements I need to focus on while I'm evaluating this assessment. Where do I feel the student is in each area? So this is a great tool. And like I said before, it lends itself to that really specific detailed feedback um, where students can go in and say, okay, I didn't do so well on my grammar, but I see that I did really well with my organization of my presentation. So then they can focus in and say, what do I need to focus on with the grammar? Whereas if I saw a score of three, I might not necessarily know that the reason why I scored that way was because of my use of grammar during the presentation. So that's a nice plus of the analytic scale with rubrics. We also learned about the resource RubyStar to create rubrics. I have the address here, rubystar.forteachers.org. And this is a wonderful tool I've been playing with to create rubrics. So basically, it kind of does the work for you, which is really nice. As online teachers, we have to be very mindful about using our time wisely. So we can basically go in and create different rubrics using different categories and um, sometimes they'll even sort of fill in some suggestions for you. You can go in and edit those or you could completely scratch those and make your own criteria. So it's super flexible and super fun and easy to use. Next we'll talk a little bit about designing effective online assessment tasks for the interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational modes. And we had that with Leah Grinner Kennedy. And the discussion prompt she gave us is how do we build online assessments in alignment with the world readiness standards to reflect teaching towards proficiency and all three modes of communication. So her presentation basically did a great job answering that question. So how we want to do that is we want to use the world readiness standards for online language learning to plan effective curriculum assessment and instruction. And we want to do that using the five C's. I have the little graphic here of communication, cultures, connections, comparisons, and communities. The challenge we wanna think about whenever we're doing this is how can we integrate all of the five C's into our lessons and in a meaningful and authentic way for our students. So that's the challenge we have to consider when we're creating our lessons. We also talked about assessing proficiency and um, we were provided this beautiful graphic by Chantel Thompson of Brigham Young University. And I really like this graphic with the analogy of a tree um, and really thinking about the assessment truly being um, the trunk of the tree, the area we want to focus on. So the trunk is to be considered as the functions. What can the students and our learners actually do with the language? As we increase the number of functions the learner can do, we can help them move up that ladder of proficiency. So that's the aspect we want to focus on in assessment is really focusing on the functions. 
Now, how to determine evidence of learning based on proficiency level in an online environment. We can do this using the actual proficiency scale. We can determine what evidence would be appropriate in order to assess students based on their level of proficiency. And a great thing to do is to go back and review those actual can-do statements. Now, I know they're in the process of being reworked. They should be out soon. But we want to make sure that our assessments align with those can-do statements and make sure that we're choosing appropriate target levels um, for the audience of students. Then talking about designing effective online learning experiences and assessments through integrated performance assessment. This is going back to what Taryn talked about, those truly being the gold standards for assessment. So the best practices here are to lead with culture. We wanna capture students' interest with the lesson by engaging them in the essential questions and the themes. And of course, we do that through culture and hooking the students with fun aspects of culture. Second, we want to create meaningful activities using all three modes of communication to create those assessments. And then finally, we want to determine what tools are needed for success. Um, in this presentation, Leah gave us a link to OFLA's IPA Tech Live Binder. A quick Google search of that pulls it up. But I was looking at this resource a few weeks ago, and I was really blown away by the tremendous amount of resources that are available um, through this organization. So I would definitely recommend checking this out if you are putting together a true IPA. So when we create our IPAs, we want to start off with a blank um, summative performance task um, basically starting off with a blank sheet. So we wanna think about the interpretive tasks we wanna use, the presentational tasks we wanna use, and the interpersonal tasks. So we wanna think about how we can sort of merge all of these together and come up with a great assessment for our students. We also have the note that we don't necessarily have to do all these things on the same day, this can come over time, but as we're sort of putting those three modes of communication to work for us, the students are going to gain a lot more from our lessons and ultimately from our assessments as well. Then talking about our toolbox, different things that we can use to um, really go in and create the assessments. We wanna think about functions and related structures and patterns and the vocabulary. Now notice this is the stuff that's kind of coming last here. Typically in the old paradigms, teachers would sit down and think about, okay, in this lesson, what vocabulary do I wanna include? What grammar points do I need to include? Whereas we're kind of working on this last. The culture is ultimately going to be driving what activities we'll be doing with the students. And then we can think about the toolbox in terms of what vocabulary do they need to accomplish these tasks? What grammar do they need to be? to be familiar with in order to accomplish the tasks we want them to do. So the toolbox is sort of coming last in this new paradigm. In our next session, we talked about providing effective online feedback, and I can vouch as an online teacher that feedback is truly um, the cornerstone of the work that I do with my students. The purpose of feedback is that feedback facilitates and enhances learning. Students learn faster when they're told what they're doing correctly and how they need to improve. And feedback also closes the gap between the current performance and their performance goals. What ultimately makes feedback effective? So effective feedback is specific, detailed, balanced, understandable, relevant, timely, receivable and acceptable, it comes from more than one source and it requests a response from the learners. That was certainly a mouthful, so to go into some specifics, as we give specific and detailed feedback to students rather than just good job, they can go in and look at the feedback and see what they're doing well and where they need to improve. We need to make sure that feedback is balanced. So there is such a thing as bombarding students with feedback, really nitpicking, going out with the red pen and just crossing everything out. We need to make sure that our feedback is balanced. We don't wanna overwhelm them, but we also don't want to let them know where they are making mistakes. So there's sort of a sweet spot we need to find with effective feedback. Students need to be able to understand the feedback. So if I'm working with my novice flow students and I write a great passage in Japanese using a lot of kanji and an advanced grammar, it might be helpful if they understood it, but if they don't understand it, it just won't be effective for them. So in some cases, it might be more effective to use um, the same language, for example, in my case, English with my students so they can understand um, what they're doing wrong. And as they move up the proficiency scale, then I can get into using the target language for feedback.
I also need to make sure that my feedback is relevant. So I need to make sure that I'm really focused um, on the task at hand and not sort of giving feedback based on uh, their personality or their interests or things like that. It really needs to be relevant to um, the topic or rather the task that they're working on versus maybe their topic if you find it interesting, for example. Um, feedback should be timely. So the sooner we can get the feedback to students, the better. Sometimes it's challenging in the online world, um, but we try to get our feedback to our students as soon as possible. If they are able to receive and accept it, so we want to make sure that it's written with a positive light so that they don't get defensive and think, oh, I'm not good at this, I'll never get there. If I'm using positive feedback with my students, um, that's going to make them more receptive to the feedback. It should come from more than one source. So um, sometimes it's helpful to do peer reviews and peer feedback as well as just having uh, feedback coming from the instructor. And great feedback also requests that response from the learners. So sometimes I like to add in uh, when we do culture discussions, things about, you know, hey, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on this cultural aspect. And I'll actually put that in the feedback. And I love when students actually take me up on that and tell me more about their thoughts. And I'm really able to get in there and find out more about what they think. Different types of feedback and mediums. We talked about written feedback. So this is going in and making corrections to the written submissions. So since we can't really get out the virtual red pen and scribble all over our computer screens, we have some different tools to do that. And we talked about those with Michelle. Um, we talked a little bit about Microsoft Word, Google Docs, and even making written co corrections in LMSs like Canvas. Just to jump ahead here, here's an example of um, some written feedback using Microsoft Word. So there are a lot of tools within um, a lot of these um, programs like Microsoft Word, Google Docs that will allow us to give specific feedback. We can add notes. We can um, use color coding and different strategies to help students understand the feedback. Oral feedback is when we correct speech. Um, we can provide corrections and also give some examples. It's also helpful. Some great tools we talked about to do this are Vocaroo, using your actual LMS, and conferencing tools like Skype or Google Hangouts. So if I'm able to meet up with a student in a Skype conference, I can give them that oral feedback um, and help them continue to progress. We also talked about peer-driven feedback. This is helpful to use, um, and it's helpful to use tools like rubrics and checklists so that students can go through and provide helpful and useful feedback in a very objective manner. So if I had a classroom of students and I handed them a blank sheet of paper and I said, here you go, write some feedback, I know inevitably I'll have a few students that might just write good job and tune out for the rest of the presentation. Through having a clear set rubric, the students can be objective and they can listen carefully and look for things that they wanna point out when they're giving feedback. In our next presentation, talking about tools and technologies for online assessment with Eric Voss, um, one of the key takeaways here I remember was talking about when we're trying to find the tools and technology, there are this spend diagram that shows the elements of speed, cost, and quality. And in the middle of all three, unfortunately, is this black area called impossible. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to find tools that are fast, they are cost effective, sometimes free, and of high quality. So often you're kind of sacrificing one of these elements in order to get the other two. Um, however, as online teachers, we need to continue to keep looking for other tools that might help us to accomplish our objectives in, in assessment. We talked about a few tools for assessment, Google Forms. So we went through and looked at how we can create Google Forms to make a great free online assessment. Um, we talked about some of the tools that allow us to see what students are inputting, um, and how that works. Another great tool is languagetesting.info. This is a tool that is used to evaluate the assessment. The assessment. This also has the distractor analysis. So we looked at some questions and questions that had answers that were supposed to serve as distractors and to see what the rates students were of picking those distractors. So if we used a tool like languagetesting.info on one of our questions, a lot of students were getting wrong and finding that students were picking one particular distractor more often, we might need to go back and revisit that exam to make the assessment um, truly a better indicator of what the student has learned versus a better indicator of students being able to pick a distractor. Fluency Tutor is another great tool. This allows students to record their reading and teachers can provide feedback. 
We also learned about Ruby Star and Orange Slice. So as we saw with our presentation with JD Brown, we can create really detailed and intricate rubrics using Ruby Star. And we also learned from Eric about providing um, feedback in those rubrics using Orange Slice. So Orange Slice has a lot of really great tools that will um, allow us to provide more detailed feedback. We can use a rubric where Orange Slice will color code um, on the rubric where the student lands, and that's also a very useful tool. Some other tools like languagetool.org and wordandphrase.info, these are free tools that will allow us to provide real-time um, feedback with grammar, text, um, and word frequency focus. So these might be useful tools for students who want to get some feedback right away. We also talked about tools that check for plagiarism like turnitin.com and Paper Raider. So it's nice to have that um, extra set of eyes out there looking on the internet for um, instances where students might be plagiarizing. And we also talked about some interactive quiz tools that collect performance reports such as Quizlet and Kahoot. Quizlet is great because students can go through and, um, for example, practice vocabulary and they can see out of a list of 20 that I have mastered 18, I'm still struggling with two of these and they can go through and continue to hone their practice based on those results. Kahoot is a lot of fun. Um, it is a little bit more of a real-time tool, but it allows teachers to see in detail kind of what students are choosing, what options that they're picking with their assessments. So it gives teachers um, a really nice overview and they're able to see um, in detail how students are performing using the analytics tools in Kahoot. Then we talked about emerging technologies and how these are already changing and will continue to change the shape of online assessment in the future. We talked about facial and gesture recognition tools, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and virtual reality. Now, while these are really truly leading edge and cutting edge technologies, and maybe we're not using these in the classroom right now, I think it's pretty safe to bet that within 10 to 20 years, we might be using tools like facial and gesture recognition, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, to help us out with our online assessments. In our next um, overall, um, segment, we had a session on plagiarism, cheating, and proctoring in online courses. Um, and Jennifer gave us this quote that will stick with me, tell the truth or eventually someone will tell it for you. This was from novelist Stephanie Klein and essentially her presentation covered the importance of um, just making sure that our students are working with academ within academic integrity guidelines um, and telling the truth essentially on where they're at with their assessments. We talked about plagiarism in this session. So plagiarism, um, basically like it was said, it expands beyond just copying and pasting of text. So plagiarism could potentially include close imitation of language and thoughts. It could include summarizing content without using your own words. And um, because some people, such as students or parents, weren't familiar, they thought it was more of just the copying and pasting, um, BYU actually implemented a three-minute academic honesty tutorial that explains plagiarism to students and gives them some common examples. So that way, it's very clear to students as well as their parents if they watch it, what are the expectations, what is plagiarism, what do we consider plagiarism, and how can you avoid that in the future? We watched a great video from the Behavioral Science Guys. Uh, to be honest, I never saw their videos before, but afterwards I checked out a few of them. They were very entertaining and informative. And we talked a little bit about in this video about why do we lie? So in our society, telling a lie is usually associated with a moral defect. But as the Behavioral Science Guys prove for us that it might not necessarily be that people who tell lies are morally bankrupt. It might just be that um, based on their research that telling a lie is more commonly caused by what's called moral slumber. So essentially, we're not really thinking about telling lies and our conscience might be asleep at the switch. So the solution was to spend less time judging and spend more time alerting. So rather than coming down harsh on students that might, um, you know, tell a lie or breach academic integrity, it might be prudent for us as online educators to more frequently alert students as to what we expect in terms of academic integrity and honesty in our assignments. So 
the suggestion was to create moral wake-up calls, sort of polite reminders um, prior to the moment of decision. Um, I can vouch certainly that I just implemented this in my class. This week, my students are taking their midterm exams. And one of the first things I put in my announcements where students go in every day to see what they need to work on was a reminder of our academic integrity policy, just reminding them that we take academic integrity very seriously at our organization. And even though we are an online school, we expect that students are going to abide by the same moral code in terms of test taking that they would take at their face-to-face -face school. So how exactly can we implement these moral wake-up calls? So a few suggestions are, for example, the tutorial that was created at BYU that explains plagiarism. Sometimes it really might be a matter of students not understanding or not completely grasping that what they're doing is wrong. We also need to explain the appropriate use of online translators. One of the things my courses has is an online translator quiz that basically has students copy and paste text in English, translate the text to Japanese, then use another online translator to translate it back to English and see just how, let's say interestingly, um, online translators can behave and how it is very easy for a teacher to identify work that was created using an online translator. We also need to thank students for being honest. Um, during the presentation, um, one of the um, instructors at BYU puts this um, little mark on all the assessments of on your honor, you will do your best. So as students are going through their assessment and seeing that consistent on your honor, you will do your best. Those are just reminders, gentle reminders that it is expected that students will abide by academic integrity guidelines. Also, it's important to give students the opportunity to tell you about what happened if they did breach academic integrity. So we had um, two great stories about um, students who, you know, maybe didn't make the best judgment calls, but in the heat of the moment, they felt like they had to resort to breaching academic integrity. Um, we had the story about the student who took the um, oral exam and had his friends sort of feeding answers to him. And then at the end of the exam, the teacher said, you know, I heard some strange things. Is there anything you would like to tell me? And then at the time, the student kind of broke down and said, yes, I'm so sorry I cheated. I don't know what I was thinking. So in this case, it ended really positively that the student-teacher relationship wasn't damaged. Now, if the teacher had taken an, an approach where they said, I know where you were cheating and you did a really bad thing and I am really disapprove of what you did, that's always going to damage the student-teacher relationship. So we definitely need to give our students the benefit of the doubt. We need to give them the opportunity to explain what happened. Um, and ultimately, that might also help you as a teacher determine why did the student commit the academic integrity violation? Are they just not feeling confident? Can we give them other resources to help them boost their confidence and not feel like they need to revert to cheating? We also talked about proctoring. So proctoring is important, especially with online-based assessments. We talked about using certified proctors in order to help mitigate academic dishonesty, where students will go into um, a space where there is a designated professional proctor there to proctor the exam and make sure that the student is behaving as expected. There are also some new online proctoring services that are being pioneered to keep the proctoring fees to a minimum and also allow for easier access to students. When I took my oral proficiency exam with ACTFL um, last March, I used one of these online proctoring services and it was fantastic. I didn't need to hire a babysitter um, to go um, out of my house. I was basically able to just, um, you know, kind of sit the kids down and have them be quiet. And I was able to, you know, not go anywhere, which was really nice, especially if you have to put a three and a five-year-old in a car and bundle them up in the dead of winter and go somewhere to be watched and then have to drive somewhere to be proctored. So it was a great tool. And um, in my case, it was super convenient. And the fee was fairly reasonable. I know that some, um, some of the major chain learning centers um, have very steep fees for proctoring. Um, so it's nice to use those online service to keep the cost to a minimum. There's also different tools you can use to lock down other tasks on computers, such as um, one I used when I was taking an online class where it would basically lock down everything on my computer except for the browser, and I was able to go ahead and take the exam. So that way we know that students aren't going through and looking at other web pages, trying to find answers. They're focused on the exam and not clicking off onto other things. 
So this is the very last slide for our webinar series. I truly have to send a warm mahalo to all of you. This has been such a fun and rewarding experience for me. I have loved getting to know all of you, getting to know you through the um, discourse in the TED Ed chats and um, getting to know all of you through the chat as well. So thank you all so much for being here. I do want to share a few links. Um, the link I have up here is a detailed piece that explains the badge criteria. So what exactly you need to do to order a bat to earn the badge if you are planning on pursuing the badge. And that outlines exactly what needs to be done. I also want to encourage everybody to keep in touch. So the National Foreign Language Resource Center, I have their website there. The website is amazing. There's always new tools, new studies, new things to read about. Um, so this is a great website. I definitely would recommend checking this out. And don't forget to follow them on Twitter at NF LRC. Um, I just saw an article a little bit ago about how um, some people are preserving endangered languages through Minecraft. And had I not followed them on Twitter, I never would have known that. So I thought that was really neat. If you have questions or concerns, please reach out to me. Um, my email address is posted there. You can also tweet me at Bhutan Sensei if you are on Twitter and you prefer to use that. 